there, and then we'll wrap up here with Nancy Hayden, and uh, she is with the Farm Between, and the presentation is Practicing Agroecology at the Farm Between. Nancy and her husband John own and manage the Farm Between, an organic fruit farm, fruit nursery, and pollinator sanctuary. Nancy is also an artist, writer, and emeritus environmental engineering professor at the University of Vermont, and in all areas, she focuses on sustainabilities and education. So welcome, Nancy. Thanks so much. So I feel a bit like the, uh, the last person on a relay here, and I think I'm supposed to make up 15 minutes, but um, that's going to be a little tough. Uh, anyway, so it's a privilege uh, to be here and to share and talk with you about one of my passions, and that's our farm and uh, raising uh, f growing food. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is practicing agroecology at the farm between our farm. And by practicing, I mean it in both senses of the word. Uh, practicing means um, doing, um, you know, put into practice. But practicing also means rehearsing, practicing daily um, to improve and to improve your skills and things like that. John and I were both trained initially as uh, ecologists, and so um, he often jokes that we're ecologists uh, with a farming problem. And um, so uh, this picture, um, I like this picture. It's about, it's actually a little dated. It's from about 2000, but it gives you an idea of, of our farm and uh, when I think of the farm, I think of not just the land and the plants and animals, but I also think about the people, uh, us and the, the people visiting. And I also think about oops, this massive infrastructure that we bought with the farm. We're not a dairy farm, um, and this was the original uh, originally uh, a dairy farm with a lot of buildings. We actually took down four, um, four uh, additional barns that we sold and, um, because we knew we wouldn't be able to keep them up. Um, so having a large infrastructure like this is both a blessing and a curse. Um, it's a curse in that we've probably put about $200,000 worth uh, of money into upkeep and repair, not renovation, just upkeep and repair over the last 22 years. Um, it's also a little bit of a curse in that if you have any inkling of a hoarding instinct, you now have a gigantic barn you can fill. <laughs> But it's also a blessing in that it's really uh, a historic, uh, beautiful uh, buildings and barns that have a lot of, uh, you know, connect us with the past and, and uh, hopefully with the future. And um, I've even seen um, several years ago, somebody brought back an egg carton from, from Pennsylvania for us. And on the front of it was our farm. Um, the buildings. And last year at the NOPA conference in 2014, somebody was up here talking about a farm in Iowa, and they had a picture of our farm on it. So I was like, people, this is a, it's a very beautiful place. So I don't want to complain, but it is a, I, I would say it is a physical factor and maybe a constraint in some, in some ways too. Um, so anyway, like I said, this is a little bit dated. Um, we have some blueberry, uh, early blueberry plantings here, black currants here. We only have one of our uh, unheated greenhouses. Um, and this was sort of when we were transitioning from a organic vegetable, uh, here's our chicken tractor, small livestock operation to an organic fruit farm. And why don't we get another? Nope. Okay. This little button was supposed to work, but I guess it doesn't. So anyway, we're an organic uh, fruit farm. We have about 30 uh, different varieties of our different types of fruit that we grow. Everything from rhubarb that I just delivered 285 
uh, pounds of rhubarb to the Intervale Food Hub this morning. Uh, Hascaps are coming in, honeyberry, and uh, two strawberries, apples, everything, uh, currants, a lot of currants, red and black currants. Um, So we sell a lot of that uh, fresh and to wholesale accounts, but we also take the fruit that we don't sell and maybe some fruit that's blemished um, and use it to make these fruit syrups. And we sell these at the local uh, Burlington Farmer's Market. And then we take the fruit sir syrups and add value to them by making fruit fountain sodas and snow cones. So an alternative, uh, healthier, treat to high fructose corn syrup, pesticide ridden types of unsustainable things. Um, but uh, uh, this is a great way to extend our season and also uh, extend the cash flow throughout the season. Uh, we're also a fruit nursery. We do a lot. We've been propagating a lot of our pl own plants over the years, so we decided to open a fruit nursery and and um, and pollinator uh, plants. And uh, this kind of goes into one of the things that we're also passionate about is encouraging other people to grow their own food. So I'm going to just jump on my uh, soapbox for a minute here. And uh, I, I have a, a blog that deals with World War I because I'm really interested in World War I, too. And um, I just did a blog posting on uh, victory gardens. And these started in World War I. There was over 5 million gardens in the US during the um, short time that we were involved in World War I. And in World War II, there was over 20 million gardens. By the end of World War II, about 40% of the uh, fruits and vegetables that were consumed by the civilians in the United States came from these victory gardens. And um, I think it's really impressive and something we can all think about um, as a model for, um, for what we can, what's possible in terms of growing our own food. Um, I would like to see personally an orchard and garden and berry bushes around every home, uh, school, uh, prison, um, vacant lot, um, islands uh, in, in uh, roadways and things like that. And um, I, I think growing food really changes your relationship with food. And, and I think that's something that people are going to talk about tomorrow is, is uh, issues around food and obesity and nutrition and things like that. And, and something you can do is, is grow your own food and really, uh, really just changes your whole sense of that, or at least it did for me. Um, I think it's healthy in terms of both the doing and the eating, and um, it, you know it provides some food sovereignty. Um, interestingly, though, during World War II, the Department of Agriculture was against uh, the Victory Garden idea because they thought it was going to compete with with uh, commercial growers and stuff. But eventually, they came on board. Um, during both World Wars, the um, War Department actually was the big sponsor and promoter of these gardens and gardening activities, which I thought was kind of interesting. But I don't think we need a world war to get us back to victory gardens. At least, hope, I hope not. Anyway, we are also a pollinator sanctuary. We basically turned our 14 acres of pasture, back pa that used to be pasture for the, the dairy, and uh, allowed the goldenrod, uh, joe pie weed, milkweed, asters, and things to grow. But we've also planted several hundred trees and, bear and bushes, and we have several hundred more to go. This is uh, me last week in front of the um, black locust, blooming black locust that is, should be, everyone should right now write it on your bucket list of things that you should do is be able to smell uh, black locusts in flower because it's amazing. Um, so uh, we have a lot of school programs and um, camp programs and college programs that tour and work on our farm and they help with planting, weeding and harvesting. It's really a great educational opportunity. Oh, by the way, it is National Pollinator Week um, as well this week. so. Um, we should all be thinking about that. Anyway, um, you know, as fruit growers, it's pretty obvious that fruit, that pollinators are going to be important to us. Every 
uh, all of our fruit starts with a flower, whether it's um, raspberries in, in our, our unheated greenhouse, blueberries, strawberries, or whatever you have. Um, so it's pretty clear that uh, we need to um, provide for these um, pollinators that do so much work for us on the farm. And one of the things that we can do is provide the season-long nectar and pollen resources by planting a variety of, of plants, not just in our pollinator sanctuary, but all around the farm. Um, we've also uh, received um, SARE uh, cover, uh, cover crop um, grant that dealt, deals with pollinator research on the farm and looking at several different cover crops to see uh, which ones also provide um, pollinator services. And we're looking specifically at Phasalia and buckwheat and a um, commercial bee mix. And with some interesting results that I don't have time to go into now. But um, I think this is also something that that, that as farmers we can do is to provide these types of resources when we're um, using cover crops or in, in areas where we're not in production. And that was part of what we were looking at here as well. But it's not just about floral resources. The um, native bees, uh, bumblebees and things like that need uh, nesting habitat. Um, all, and so we've, per, we've been exploring and experimenting with different kinds of bee houses um, using rushes or um, this is a blue mason, uh, blue mason bee house. Here's a blue mason bee. They do a lot with orchards and that kind of thing. So um, for bumblebees, they need also uh, ne nesting habitat but also overwintering habitat. We practice at the farm between a little bit of scruffy farming and our, our neighbors who used to be the owners of the farm have complained over the years because we've let our riparian zones uh, grow back and have a lot of trees and plants and bushes growing in them. We also produce some of these um, areas of, of brush and brambles and things like that that actually provide a great habitat, overwintering habitat for bumblebees. Um, also, they eventually what we do with these, and we have a lot of these around the farm, eventually we'll cover these over with manure and um, compost and plant into them. And this is something borrowed from permaculture where it's called hugel culture. And uh, it's basically in German mound culture, and um, all these this uh, stuff will decompose over time, and then you will have sort of a raised bed, a nice raised bed to to continue to plant into. Um, but meanwhile, they also provide services. John calls them bumble culture, and um, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, as farmers, we're also interested in climate change. One thing about um, uh, where we live up in uh, north central um, Vermont is that historical weather data and recent weather data show that we're getting about seven to nine inches more uh, rainfall per year than the 100 year average. And this has been steadily increasing from um, the 100 year average for about the last 30 years. So we're seeing more flooding, more erosion, more wet fields, and new diseases and um, pests. And this is our farm um, in a flood a couple of years ago. So we've been planting elderberry, we've been changing what we're planting in certain wet fields. We've been planting like elderberry and, and aronia, and the, this is also, we've been planting silver maple and willows in riparian zones and wet parts of the pasture. And we can use these for coppicing and using the wood, wood chips. We use a lot of wood chips on the farm and um, also erosion control. We have five unheated greenhouses now, two with fall raspberries um, and apples in half of one, ever-bearing strawberries in another, and cherry tomatoes in another. And this pro really provides disease 
uh, protection from rain and moisture, especially with things like raspberries, which are very sensitive to moisture, as well as frost control um, for the, both the apples, early, uh, early blooming, any early blooming and uh, disease, I mean, uh, and the raspberries as well for late frost control. Um, finally, the la one of the last things that we've been doing, there's Act 148 in Vermont is, uh, is uh, about uh, collecting all the organic matter, keeping it out of landfills by 2020, and it's phased in with large producers now to mid-size to eventually homeowners. Everybody, no one will be allowed to put food scraps or other organic matter in landfills in Vermont. So we actually teamed up with Highfields Composting and, and two local elementary schools and businesses, and we collect their food scraps and we actually get paid for collecting their food scraps, and then we feed it to our chickens, and, the, um, and then from there we can take that material once the chickens have gone through it and use it in um, high temperature thermophilic uh, composting to organic standards and use it right on the farm. One thing, we, uh, I know a lot of people are interested in food uh, projects and, and school lunches and things like that. I will say that it's amazing how much food is wasted in the schools and just basically whole apples are coming into the farm. And the chickens love them, but it, it does seem like kind of a travesty there. Um, anyway, I think, I don't think I made up time, but I kept on time. So um, thank you.